Nick Bosa doesn't seem to be too worried about the status of his contract, but when he gets paid, it will be quite a bit of money. We'll get into that, what Nick Bosa looks like jumping into mini camp, some other conversations about some other pass rushers, namely rookie Drake Jackson in 49ers camp. Get a little bit into the Locked On 49ers mailbag and my co-host Eric Crocker's journey through OTAs and mini camp when he was in camp with the New York Jets. All that coming up right now. You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On 49ers, Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker with you at PD Peacock at Eric underscore Crocker. If you don't know us, I'm an NFL analyst, uh, formerly working at PFF, doing fantasy blurbs at Roto Wires, where I got my start in sports media, uh, local radio in the San Francisco Bay Area as a producer, a little bit of on-air stuff, traffic reporter doing radio work. Eric Crocker, of course, you know, and you love him, former AFL, NFL, cornerback, arena bowl champion. Also the co-host of Locked On NFL Draft. And also you can find me on the Peacock and Williamson NFL show here daily on the Locked On Podcast Network. Both of us double dipping here on the network. I do want to let everybody know that we appreciate you making Locked On 49ers your first listen every day here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day is what we do. There is no offseason in the NFL, even though they wrapped it up, Croc. It's all wrapped up. Mini camp's over. They canceled the last day of practice, having a little friends and family barbecue on the practice field. Uh, so, yeah, that that's uh, I guess that's a good way to. And I, I guess it's better that was it last year when Shanahan was forced to just not have practices because he broke the rules or something. <laughs> and then, well, no, there's too many injuries, right? Is that what it was? No, but I think he already had decided he was going to end things. And, and that's what he does. Right. And he kind of yeah. talked about that in his post press conference or whatever he was like man we'd like to go about 12 days and then all right send the guys on their way so i think last year maybe he got his 12 days in and ended it early but i think because he did get busted for a player touching another player which is really wild i, I that wasn't my experience in otas at all uh we were going all out for the most part but right. uh, yeah. I, think I can't wait to ask busted. about that, too, because yeah. because I know it was a little bit different, especially under Rex Ryan. And that was less than 10 years ago. Right. And so how much things have changed. In the NFL? That's that's pretty amazing. Um, it, it's it's kind of messed up on one hand. Right. Especially someone like Debo Samuel or uh, Nick Bosa. Right. Well, they've got something going off the field that's, or, you know, like Bosa works out and uh, does an amazing job working out with his family in Florida. Debo's got a contract thing and it's like mandatory mini camp. So you have to show up and then they cut it short. And it's like, well, what, why is it? Why'd you make me come out here? And then you cut it short. Like if we're going to work, let's work, you know? So it's kind of, it, I see it. I see the other side of it. It's like you forced me to come out here so we can have a barbecue on the field. Right. It's kind of weird. So they can literally be there for two, three days, two days. Yes. Two Which days isn't, I mean, maybe if you factor that in ahead of time, like, look, we're going to go out there and we'll be out there for a week. Right, we're flying on Monday, and we're flying Sunday, and then we'll leave the following Sunday. And you know, a lot of these guys have their homes out there anyway. For guys, at least when I was playing, uh, for guys that are the air crockers of the world, they purchase your flights and everything for you anyway, so you don't have to worry about that. That's all good. Then that yeah, that's good. Um, it's it's a fun time of year because I think a lot can be gained for some players and that's what i want to talk to you about a little bit later about your experience through otas and minicamp and what that means for some players on the field even though some you know for some players they don't want to be there at all and they think it shouldn't exist um but i want to talk first about nick bosa and his contract situation because i you know it's funny is people are surprised people keep talking about nick bosa like it's some imminent thing and something needs to happen he's still under contract for next year yeah. at a nice bump in salary in the fifth year option so i don't know why people keep talking about nick bosa as oh he's gonna get a deal this summer and it's gonna be some you know something has to be done it's like no there, there's a lot of time and nick bosa is a next summer problem i think and actually for the 49ers they'll probably want to ink him to a deal next year and get his fifth year option number down and so they can control the salary cap for 2023 by doing a new deal with him because that's one of the benefits of signing a, a player that already makes a lot of money 
as Bosa does as a number two overall pick, because you can actually get their cap number that first year down because you convert uh, base salary into uh, bonus money and it gets you know advertised over the course of his uh of his contract so when nick bosa does sign it's going to be a big money deal obviously and nick bosa himself doesn't seem to worry about it which is a good sign uh, bosa was asked about it when he was at the podium at minicamp and he said quote i'm sure i'll be notified um i've just been focusing on getting better i'll let my agent worry about that so yeah there, there's definitely no worries about nick bosa's contract right now who knows if he holds out from you know and asks for a trade next year i have no idea but that it's definitely a 2023 problem for nick bosa's contract which is probably encouraging you know if you are a member of the 49ers front office trying to figure out what to do with debo samuel who definitely takes priority right now because this the last year of his contract but the bosa's at least from what their reputation is kind of look more difficult guys to kind of deal with and so far, it seems like Bosa, outside of, I think, signing his initial rookie contract, which I think there was kind of a snag for just a little bit. I think he finally signed it, like, maybe the day of training camp or whatnot. But it's been pretty easy going. And I feel like he, out of everyone that's on the team, like, you don't have to worry about Nick Bosa. He's going to come in shape, the best shape of his life every year. Somehow he continues to get better. I have no idea how he does it. But the body fat percentage just keeps it's dropping. Always, but there's like a... There's like a sliding scale of where you get to a dangerously low level of body fat. And I feel like folks is right there. Like you get under 4%. I don't think that's healthy for you. That's what they say. You you don't want to be too tightly wound, but he's tightly. I mean, when you see him up at the press conference, I mean, you just see every muscle in his arms. And when you see him on the field in his football pants, you see every muscle in his legs. I mean, that's a, that's a ripped up guy. And I don't, I, I wonder what kind of genetics you have to have to just walk around where when you work out, that's what happens to your body. Like that's the outcome. That's not what happens to me. Well, yeah, because you can work and and improve what you have, but you have to have a certain genetic profile to get to the point where you have that level of explosion and power and athleticism and quads and you know abs. But you're also 260 plus pounds because most people who are 260 plus pounds aren't shaped like that. So I always talk about uh, you know because I train a lot of athletes. And I'm like, man, well, if you, you know, you look at a sprinter's body and you look at a mile runner's body, like, look how much different they they look because mile runners, you know, they're running and they, they break down those fast twitch muscles and you see that they lose weight, but they're just like very thin people. Whereas you look at a sprinter, I mean, look what their bodies look like, right? I mean, muscle up, rocked up. But the one thing that we're, we're kind of forgetting in that, or at least what I'm always forgetting is maybe that sprinter just has those genetics <laughs> and maybe that long distance runner just has those genetics and that's why they look the way they do more so than is because they run miles and that that's why they look like that yeah it's like offensive linemen too like you don't choose offensive line offensive line chooses you right because right. it's like what, what else are you going to play when you when you're that big and you're big boned and it's like well you got to play on the line somewhere because at some point you're gonna you know you're gonna you see it with a lot of players too it's like when they're younger they're running back or they're uh, a tight end or a wide receiver. And they keep getting bigger and keep getting bigger. I was like, well, I'm not going <laughs> to stop this train. I'm going to keep getting bigger. So I better just roll with it or else I'm going to not play football unless I play offensive or defensive line. I will say, if you are ever standing next to an offensive tackle, they don't look like what they look like on TV. Like in person, they just look like tight ends or something. Like they're very lean mm. uh, looking. Trent Williams is like one of the bigger ones. He's more the one of the more wide uh, offensive tackles, but a lot of offensive tackles I've been around, you you know that uh, well. This is a big guy, but I don't think you think like oh offensive line. I tell you what, even one time I was standing next to Joe Staley, I'm like golly, Joe Staley looks like a tight end. He was he was a tight end, yeah, and, and kind of well, college you know, drew out of that. Um, I I so hold on really quick in. I love Kyle Shanahan's quote from earlier on. It's funny because all this stuff happens in the off season. And it's like, man, is it going to get to Kyle Shanahan? Is it going to, you know, ruin the chemistry of the team? There's the Jimmy G stuff, the Trey stuff, the Debo stuff, you know, Nick Bosa's is not showing up uh, doing his own thing. What's going on here. And Kyle Shanahan shows up and he's like, yeah, me and Debo are cool. Debo shows up and acts like he's kind of involved and cares about being there. And, 
someone asked him about Nick Bosa and he's like, yeah, good Florida tan quad still looking huge. You know, he's like, so, you know, it, Kyle's kind of a cool customer. He's been around the NFL for a long time. So I guess he understands the personalities and how things work in the league. So maybe that's why things don't phase him. But I, I, it's funny because there's a lot of ways things could have gone wrong. A lot of drama for the 49ers. And I feel like all of a sudden now they break spring practices. And I've, I feel like it's a really good vibe around the 49ers all of a sudden. I didn't <laughs> really feel like good. that two weeks ago. Yeah, no, nah, and Cal Shanahan, he's one of those guys too, where you know, I was a little worried a little bit because you know, he we know he can be kind of a hard ass, you know, a little bit, like just the way he comes off. But one thing is for sure, the, the players that he likes, he loves those guys. And Debo Samuel and Nick Bosa are two of those guys. So probably in his eyes, they can't do any wrong. And he knows the business element of things and understands it and probably lets them know, hey, I I, I get it. So we'll figure it out. We'll get it right. Just please, you know, just for, for me, can you just show up <laughs> and smile a little bit? Debo did just that. Sorry, it's, I muted again. I got a window right in front of my my computer here it's like the sun's going down but it's like also getting dark so it's like do i go with the light in my face <laughs> through the window? i had the, the shades kind of blocking it so i don't know what to do my, my lighting situation has got to be fixed here i figured out the blue screen the blue tint thing that was going on with my camera though so i figured that out at least but now i've got a lighting situation i have a black curtain or black uh yeah curtain over my window that's directly in front of me yeah, yeah, like you don't want any outside light screwing with what you've got so you can have full control of your lighting, right? Yeah, and I have lighting that comes through here, but it's just not as much to affect anything. Eric Crocker, what was it like going through OTAs? That is what we'll get into next here on Locked On 49ers. I got a couple of really good questions that kind of pertain to the pass rush and the 49ers and the pass defense and some other good quotes about the 49ers second round pick in Drake. Jackson from mini camp, all that coming up very shortly, but I want to let the folks out there know about bet online. And if you are excited, you're feeling that good vibe after spring practices, like me and croc are with the 49ers. Guess what? You'll lay down some money on the 49ers to go win the super bowl or maybe trade Lance for MVP you can get some pretty good odds on that right now at BetOnline.net, your number one source for all your betting stats and sports information find all the latest sports developments news and odds including not only nfl futures nba finals are going crocs having a good time as a lakers fan uh chopping it up with with warriors fans right now although there is you know some i got some questions with croc about that about how he could root for the the celtics as a lakers fan too because there's 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 some interesting uh, angles there for Crocker right now. And I think he's just trying to play the heel on Twitter today. I saw him going off on another fan too today. And uh, he's not having it. NHL Hockey Conference Finals, Major League Baseball, and of course the latest fighting news, MMA, UFC, boxing. Bet Online is your continued source for not just sports wagering, but information, live betting, esports, Vegas casino games, and more. Get over to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. At Bet Online, where the game starts. Thanks again, everybody, for making Locked On 49ers your first listen every day here on the Locked On Podcast Network. We do have an important favor to ask of you. We've put together a survey network wide so we can learn more about listeners like you, and you can make your favorite Locked On Podcasts even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like, what you don't like about Locked On Podcasts. Go to lockedonpodcasts.com slash survey right now to get started won't take very long and everyone that completes the survey can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 one hundred dollar ticket master gift cards so uh, to take your audience survey go to locked on podcasts.com slash survey and we appreciate your help on that one before we get to croc's story of otas and mini camp i have a quote here and this is interesting because I've seen some clips from, you know, OTAs and minicamp, not a ton of stuff, but you see some videos here and there, you know, some drills, nothing that you can take major. And I, even, even if you're there in person, and it's not to say that the guys that are there and in person, and the guys and gals that are covering the team don't have good information and, and, and can't help uh, paint a picture of what's going on in minicamp. But I, I don't think you can take too much away from it. But there are certain things that are pretty obvious. And the Drake Jackson stuff is interesting to me because Nick Bosa, was asked not only about his quads, but he was asked about his new uh, rookie teammate in Drake Jackson, 49ers second round pick. 
He said Drake Jackson can do things that he couldn't his rookie year, specifically his natural bend and flexibility. And those are things we saw on tape at USC from Drake Jackson. Samson Abelcom said his first impression of Drake Jackson was, damn, he's good. And uh, Bosa also credited Drake Jackson with a desire, saying he's a sponge of information. So it's interesting. When I saw Drake Jackson on the practice field, I got to be honest, Croc, I thought he looked a little sloppy. I thought he looked <laughs> just, you know, he, he wasn't in game shape, right? He wasn't in in week one shape. And I know you've talked about it before, how guys will show up in OTAs. And then it's not that long. Two months later, they're a different person in training camp. So I wonder, like, I think there's a lot of working out to be done. A lot of, hey, you better show up this weight. Or we're going to find your ass kind of stuff. I think that's, I think, I, I literally think that's the messaging from some, uh, you know, from some teams to some players. Maybe it's that way for Jake, Drake Jackson. Maybe he's at, at 275 pounds right now. And they say, hey, we want you at 260, you know. And yeah, if you come no, up with no, 261, no. we're going to find you. Yeah. They'll, they'll figure that out. They'll figure out what they feel is the, like the optimal playing weight for him and like, all right, if you're, if you're here, this would be the, where you get the best version of yourself in the most uh, functionality out of your body. So uh, hopefully they do do that. And it seems like they've done that with like Aaron Banks. I just don't think he wanted to take a full year to figure that out when it comes to Dre Jackson. Right. Like did anybody tell Aaron Banks that before training camp last season? Like, all right, you know what, look, man, you, you showed up to OTAs a certain way. You can't be like that when you show up at training camp. Like yeah, that conversation hurts. happened because if 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 it did and he still showed up like that, which is hard, you know, you gotta you gotta drop a lot of weight. But it's easier to lose some of the weight than it is to uh, like be a guy that's you know a six one, two hundred pound corner and have to kind of teeter that line between one ninety five, yeah. one ninety six. You know, like yeah, that, yeah. that's difficult. Dropping four pounds versus dropping like 25 pounds, it's a very different situation. Well, it's guys, actually easier though. That's the same. So the guys who can drop yeah. 25 have a lot more to mess with, right? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, to the point of the flexibility and stuff, it's it's a good sign actually because, you know, I, I wasn't there watching him work out and watching him move, but it's a good sign if Drake Jackson's body maybe isn't in the right shape it needs to be that he's still – looks like that to his teammates and standing out to his teammates was like, okay, this guy's got something and he's not even at prime physical condition yet. Not at the right playing weight. So it's going to be fun. Well, I think if there's one thing, if there's anyone where you, you know, you can be a sponge and kind of see how they do things. It's like, well, let me look at what this hell dude, Nick Bosa does. I mean, he looks like an action figure. What are dude, you doing? What I, the number one thing you should do if you're the 49ers for any young defense lineman is send him to Florida with the Bosa's. Yeah. What better play? Like Trey, Trey Lance is with um, QB, uh, 3D QB, right? Yeah. In in Southern California, working out in the offseason, working on stuff. He's got Quincy Avery. He's got, um, you know, the whatever, all the best of the best to that are quarterback trainers, right? Is there a better place that you'd rather send a young pass rusher <laughs> into Florida to work out with the Boses? I can't think right. of a better place. I know. And we, we've seen some of these pass rush summits. I believe it was Eric Armstead. Uh, Michael, gosh, Bennett, Michael Bennett, uh, DeForest Buckner, they used to be out there in Hawaii. I yeah. believe it was. But, yeah, Nick Bosa, I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, the Bosa's, they feel like it's like the brothers versus everybody, and they don't care about anything else that's kind of yeah. going yeah. on. Maybe, in maybe nobody's invited. They're like, no, nah, you I can't know. see. Well, because their dad owns a gym in Florida too, right? So it's not just oh, – yeah. and I think they uh, – I remember there was a story, I think it was last off season, maybe, that they were trying to figure out – a place to buy some land to to build their own like training outdoor really? sort of facility. Yeah, so I think they've got something built by now because that was at least a year ago. That might have been a couple years ago. So they've got like an outdoor facility that they're building too to to work out, which is maybe why Bosa came back with such a great tan. Well, if they uh, ever want to come to Arkansas, I got a place for them. So you got to <laughs> yeah, you put them through DB drills. Get that get that footwork even better. Yeah. Bosa running ladder drills all day. Um, there's tight end university right in Nashville with Kittle, yeah. which I believe Trey Lance attended this off season. He will be there. I'm pretty sure it hasn't happened yet. Oh, is that what happens now? It's, oh, it's, it's a June thing. Okay. Yeah. June or July thing. June or July. Yeah. Guys cool. get extra um, working. I think that's pretty cool. They need to put together a DB summit. I, I, I heard some yeah. guys talking a little bit about it. I do remember 
uh, some guys working with Footwork King for a little bit, and there was like uh, Darius Slay, Akilah Witherspoon, Richard Sherman, uh, Xavier Rhodes. So this is a few years ago, but they need an, an updated version of that. But more like Tight End You, because Tight End You, it's a, it's a real thing. Like, it's not, hey, let's show up somewhere and just work out. It's like they go to a whole thing. Like, they have, like, an itinerary. There are a ton of Titans out there. They're all getting their work in. But I think it's, it's actually one of the cooler things. They probably have a, sp- a few sponsors for it. It's a, it's a real thing, not something just thrown together. If there was a DBU and Croc was involved and you were one of the people that were invited to help work out some some athletes, right? What What is your number one focus? What would be like, okay, Croc is the specialist of what? Like what, what, what part, like what drill would you be in charge of? Where would Croc be in that situation? Oh, that's good, man. Um, obviously like the first thing that comes swag around, on the way out, be like, hold, hold on. Like you stop every player before they walk on the field and you have a, like a box different, like, okay, you need a wristband. Okay. You got to change your face mask. And, and, and it's like, okay, you need a, you definitely need some sort of a, you know, a sleeve over here, maybe, you know, you know full leg. Is that what you, is that what you would be in charge of? Uh, that, that probably would be part of it. That just comes, that comes for free. Like that's just natural okay. for me to say something about that. But I think most importantly, one thing that I really like to do a whole lot, like there's a lot of teaching that goes on. In my drill. So I know a lot of people, you just see like drills and things like that. Like you see all people do all kind of crazy change of direction type stuff, footwork stuff. I'm not really into a whole lot of that. I like to talk about things that really translate and exactly why. So they really get the full picture and understanding exactly what we're working on, why we're working on it and how it translates to the game. So um, if they were like, are right, you going to work on this thing specifically? I probably would work more press work. Cause I really like the battle between like the spacing uh, and the defensive back dictating the space and then kind of working to get in phase and my whole dick to hip and all that type of stuff. So I probably would go more back. Cause there was, I wouldn't say off coverage, but there were a lot of people where I wasn't great in off coverage. That's why running it was really good for me, but there's people that know how to key the quarterback and stuff. Now I don't know how to key quarterback. So I probably would stay away from that. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about Croc in OTAs. Young Crocky running through OTAs, mini camp, training camp, how important it was. What does it even mean? What are you doing? What, what are you doing day to day? What's the schedule like? That is, uh, that is coming up next because I think there's some important lessons to learn about what these guys are going through right now uh, in the NFL through uh, training camp and, and mini camp and, and spring practices and all of that. I want to thank everybody for making Locked On 49ers your first listen every day. Uh, I want to make sure for your second listen, you're checking out Locked On NFL, uh, the Locked On NFL channel, which also features on YouTube the Peacock and Williamson NFL show, our national panel of NFL experts and insiders. Keep fans dialed in with the biggest stories and the latest news from around the league because an offseason doesn't equal a break in action. Follow Locked On NFL every day on the Odyssey app, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you're following the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Make sure you're, make sure you're following Croc doing the Locked On NFL Draft podcast as well. All right, Croc. OTAs. Well, first of all, so when you joined the Jets finally, because I we've told your story before how you had some workouts and what that was like, and you, yeah. you flew here, you flew there, you went and worked on your 40 time, you got it down to four fives, and then you got signed by the New York Jets. So what was the first time you actually got onto the field and started working out with other New York Jets? Yeah, at first we didn't think it was going to be until all the rookies showed up for rookie minicamp, and then from rookie minicamp on after the draft. But somehow I was able to to be listed as a veteran. So I got to show up for the very start of OTAs. So I, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, I believe I reported like April 13th or something like that. That's usually, there's like a veteran OTA that usually happens right before the draft. So that was correct. Yeah. Yeah. And was your head spinning when you showed up? What was that like for your first day of practice? Like, you don't know so, where to go. You don't know who to tell. Like, how do, who, who guides you where to go? Because I remember doing this, like, back in the day. Um, shout out to my former uh, my former uh, 
Butte College alum Aaron Rodgers, who was there around the same time at Butte College when I was there. And I walked onto the baseball team and it was just really weird because there was like players that kind of already been there and knew where they were going. And I was like, like, tell me where somebody give me some direction. Where the hell am I supposed to be right now? I didn't know anything. Like, I didn't know where to line up. I didn't know where to go. And like, no, none of the coaches were like good about helping letting you know. So it's like, whatever, I'll just figure it out, you know. And then eventually I was ended up saying, you know what, I don't want to play baseball. I'm gonna go on tour with my band in the spring anyway, because um that's where my heart lied. But um Croc, your heart clearly lied with playing ball. So that's where you were. So like what was that? What was the toughest thing when you first showed up on your first day of OTAs? I'd say the the, the first thing was just well before OTAs happened, just showing up in general and being in a locker and then seeing like Darrell Revis, Quentin Copels, Eric Crocker, Muhammad Wilkerson. Like that was the four right there in, in the row. And then Antonio Comardi a couple down. I'm just like, gosh, I'm really here. And then I see Tim Tebow walk into the locker room and I'm like kind of starstruck. And he's like, what's up, Croc? And I'm like, how the hell does he know my name? Like, you know, and it, 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 just that element because this is as much of, of football as like how much of a fan I am right now. I was then too. You know, so I had to kind of get that fandom out of my head. Yeah. And turn to like, no, Eric, like they're just like you right now. So yeah, I, uh, I, I think that was the hardest part. You said that, didn't you? You had, you're, you're in camp with the New York Jets, but you had a 49ers like phone case, right? Yeah. Like you're still <laughs> yeah. a fan. I was still That's a hilarious. fan. And it, it went, I don't want to say it went away. Maybe it wasn't as important for a little while like to be like a 49er fan, but I, I still was a 49er fan. So uh, when you were as much of a fan as I am, that's not something like that could just go away. Like at least not in that, not in a year time span. Like maybe I would have had to be with the Jets for like five, six, seven years or something like that for it to be like, okay, like I'm no longer a 49er fan. And I, I'm sure that hasn't gone away for Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady because there's been that like, oh, can I go finish my career at the 49ers, right? So, Croc, if you had a 10-year NFL career, you'd probably been like, hey, let's sign a one-year deal with the Niners and play one more season, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And we see guys, I remember uh, uh, Steve Smith, receiver. He was like, my employers were the Panthers and the Ravens or whoever else, but he was like, my favorite team is the 49ers. I still have my 49er blanket my grandma gave me. So... <laughs> Uh, I love that. So uh, some people that want to get rid of OTAs, Eric oh, Crocker no. says to that, hell no, right? No, dude. Like, it, everybody acts like it just means nothing. And for some guys like Debo Samuel, maybe even like a Brandon Ayuk, uh, you know, you can lump in maybe a Juwan Jennings into that. Obviously, like Nick Bosa, Trent Williams, those guys. Like, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. But for... 85% of the roster, it means a lot. And not in the sense of, you know, just, oh, if you don't do well here, you will get cut, which can definitely happen. I mean, I saw, it was almost like a revolving door. I saw guys getting cut left and right. You're just like, damn, like, when's the Turk coming to get me? Like, you know, like, you just know that day is coming, right? But uh, you, you want to put your best foot forward. And there are a lot of guys almost like they're kind of jockeying for a position heading into training camp. So, you know, it might not mean much to some guys, like let's say Ray Ray McLeod, where he ran down the sideline and scored a touchdown. And that might not mean much for him. But it definitely means a lot that Ambry Thomas got beat and what it means for him when it, when it pertains to jockeying for position. And are these things consistently happening during OTAs? And, you know, what does that mean heading into training camp? And as they start to really kind of set – more of the depth chart and what they want to look as it pertains to reps because they, they don't want to go into training camp and still have a ton of questions of what their depth chart is. Once you got to actual training camp, what was like, or, or even like mini camps, like what was the, the schedule like every day? What was, because for me, I think one of the coolest things is how regimented it is. Cause I think that helps young players, right? It's like, you're yeah. going to eat at this time. You're going to work out at this time. You're going to get a shake at this time. It's going to have this many calories in the shake and yeah. this much protein. I think that's actually pretty cool. So first of all, just talk about the food part, right? And, and the jets in their uh, cafeteria, whatever you want to call it. I mean, they have, first of all, their facility was really nice, really nice. Like, Theirs and 49ers, like, not nah, like the Jets is way nicer, like cafeteria, everything. And uh, so 
but but they have everything you need like anything that you need to get like they wanted me to be on a certain diet to fit a certain body fat percentage and everything and i'm able to grab all kinds of stuff do they have they had chicken sausage and i had never heard of that like you know i heard of turkey sausage and stuff but like chicken sausage like rolled up so like i was like what the heck i've never heard of this before they had all kind of cool stuff to where it was like you're you're eating very clean all right so that was cool but as far as the scheduling and things go training camp and otas two totally different schedules otas was four days a week and and we went uh monday tuesday we had wednesday off and then thursday and friday all right and each day was four hours and it was split up into uh two hours of working out so one hour on the field one hour in the weight room and then as soon as you get done with the weight room you head straight in to the uh meetings and your meetings for two hours and then your day is done so i mean there's not a whole lot of time that you're there at the facility and they have a lot of rules with the new cba and stuff like that like you can't really be there like there's certain things like you can't be on the field like a whole lot extra like you know you think like oh i'm gonna get all this extra work on the field i'm gonna do all this and be the best person to me and they're like uh get your ass off the field like <laughs> you can't be out there right now so um they have different rules and things like that but for the most part is, is, is in the sense of what you are supposed to like you're required to do it's only four hours each day and it flies by pretty good and they build it up with the phases so and then once you get to a certain point you don't do the weight room and field uh, agility training and conditioning it's you're on the actual field running plays and going through that whole thing so like that's kind of the otas which is totally different than training camp what was the best and worst single play that young croc made <laughs> during practice with the New York Jets? Was there a play that you made where they said, this dude can play and he's going to stick? Or was there a play you made where you think back and you're like, man, that one might have got me cut? Oh, man. Um, oh, yeah, I got some of both of those. Uh, I, I had a nice interception in the green-white scrimmage, which was right, right before the first uh, preseason game. Uh, that was pretty cool, picking off Matt Sims, which is Chris Sims' little brother. Uh, it was a cover three. I was splitting the difference between two and one, and uh, I kind of just read it and jumped it and had an interception. So that was pretty cool. Uh, plays where I guess could have gotten me cut. There was one play, and I remember Braylon Edwards was just like, and one of my homeboys told me because I wasn't in the receiver meeting, but one of my homeboys, uh, he was like, Yeah, Braylon Edwards was like, That's gonna get your ass cut, Croc. You know, and it was like, uh, <laughs> it was like a blown assignment. I think I just thought the ball was thrown, and it wasn't. So I was covering uh, Clyde Gates, and I was kind of, you kind of quit on the play. Yeah, and it looks like I just stopped. Like I just, and I thought I just thought the play was dead. The next thing I know, I see Gino pop out and just boop throw the ball, and I'm like, oh no. And that was training camp, and I was like, oh man, that's not good. Oh, like, oh, you you know? gotta play through the whistle, Croc. Yeah, man. So that was a that was a tough one. That was a tough one. Oh man, that's overall fantastic. though. I did like. I mean, you start talking about one on ones and all that type of stuff. Team and seven on seven. I just didn't get a ton of reps. But I mean, you can ask my brother, man. Like I was holding it down. Like the uh, lack of ability or talent that wasn't my issue. One, I sucked in special teams for whatever reason. And two, they you know they just had a couple guys get hurt, and it was like, oh well, we're going into this game and we can't put these guys on IR. We have to cut someone from where we have depth, and it happened to be me. Yeah, and there's a lot of great corners on that team, some highly drafted corners. So there's some politics. D. Miller, uh, yeah. uh, Antonio Comardi. Be honest, and, and not to like if D. Milliner is watching this podcast, not to you know throw any shade there. Crocker was better than Milliner, right? Like it. He if it wasn't for draft position and those kind of things. Would you have beat out some of those guys? I think that there should have been more of a discussion. You know, yeah. I mean, obviously, like he was. He was just as big as me. He was like 6'1", 200 pounds. Uh, he was definitely naturally more faster, but I, I, didn't, I didn't think that he was just better than me. And that was the one thing, and I think a lot of fans don't understand that part of things. A lot of it has to do with opportunity. So you can see a guy like Trent Sherfield kind of go crazy during OTAs and go crazy during training camp. And then during the season, it doesn't mean much, but not because he just forgot how to play football. It's, well, they do a lot of 21 personnel and uh, some of the sets and – it's just I just don't get as much opportunity as some of these other guys yeah. for whatever reason. And and the reason why Trent Sherfield didn't get off 
the way he possibly could have. Because it's not like, well, if I'm balling then, well, what, what, I, I can't produce during the season? Well, yeah, no, you can't if you're not given the opportunity. Week one right. he was, he caught a touchdown pass. And then it's like, well, after that, you're just not going to play. And that's the tough thing that I think a lot of people don't truly understand, like just the politics of things. So when you look at D. Milliner and my situation and some of the other guys, it was like everybody kind of had their roles that they kind of played, where even if it was my guy like Ellis Langster. Well, Ellis Langster was a cornerback. He was terrific on special teams. Uh, Isaiah Trufant, terrific on special teams. You know, he was like five foot five, 150 pounds, but he was great on special teams somehow. Uh, you know, Darren, Wall, Darren Walls, you know, this was a guy who was with the Atlanta Falcons for a bit. And then he came over to the Jets. He played a lot the, the year before. And I mean, you know, he was there. So it was it was really an uphill battle for me. But uh, I mean, that's just that's the NFL. You just need like guys to get hurt when you're kind of at the bottom. And if guys ain't getting hurt, it's just it's hard to uh, really like latch on somewhere. Well, I know why Croc wasn't great on special teams because cornerbacks can't tackle. Uh, and they can't catch, so that you know, it's, it's what are you gonna do? But you know, it's not your fault, right? Now, that's not what they had me doing. And oh man, my so, first of all, they had me trying to block guys that were like 6'5, 255 pounds, around like 4'6. Were, were you was uh, did you go through like the curse of being a big corner? So they feel like, oh, this guy's 6'1, 6'2, 200 pounds, practically safety, let's make him do big guy stuff. And you're like, no, maybe I'm pretty and quick, I don't do big guy stuff, I do little guy stuff. Yeah, it was like, dude, I'm in an outside corner. I ain't did anything else my whole <laughs> life. But my roommate, he was hell athletic. And that was the one thing where it was kind of a welcome to the NFL moment, like when we first got out there. And he ended up getting kicked out. Uh, he he got cut. Him, him and Cliff Harris. I don't know if you remember Cliff Harris from Oregon, Fresno, Fresno uh, kid, I think with the Edison. Edison and Fresno ended up going to Oregon, played at Oregon, did well, number 13. He got arrested like six times in like one week. It was like something crazy. Like he got arrested while he was out there. Uh, but him and my roommate, they were always hanging out and they both got cut the same day. But um, my roommate was kind of a freak from South from South Florida. Just big, fast, like athletic dude. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like, you know, because you don't see a lot of those guys in California. Not like that. Yeah. Yeah. Those Florida guys, where do, where do those athletes come from? It's crazy. Some of these dudes that come out of Florida. Yeah, they, uh, I, I don't know. They're made different for sure. But overall, man, um, I think one of my main takeaways was just the business aspect of things. So when Debo Samuel goes through his situation, uh, you know, when anyone goes through like their contract negotiation, when guys get cut or they bring in someone else because someone got hurt, like I, I've lived that and I've seen it and I know how on the edge a lot of these young guys are. And I know it's, it's tough, man. And, you know, the crazy thing is when I finally did get released, it was almost like a, a sigh of relief. You know, my dad died during training camp. And once he died, it was just like, I, I just, it was like, I, I just wasn't there. You know what I'm saying? And I think like when he passed, that gave me the chance to like, like, or when I had finally got released, it was like, man, I can kind of, I can kind of breathe right now. And I was kind of in this fog almost, almost maybe like, I might not even know it, but maybe like some kind of like depression. Because I always felt like I ain't never dealt with depression, but I, I might have kind of felt that because when I did get back to the arena league and I got a phone call like, hey man, you're the number one overall pick in this arena draft. And then like, it was like, like some kind of like switch went off. And like, all of a sudden it was like, I could, I could see again. And it was like, oh, and I made phone calls like, hey, I got to get on my grind. And then, you know, everything happened from there. Crazy thing is, 11 interceptions later, that next year, after being the number one pick, you would have thought, like, oh, NFL, they're going to come calling. I kept thinking all year, like, oh, NFL. And they were calling, but they just didn't bite the Panthers, the Chiefs. Uh, gosh, there were a couple other teams. And I knew, like, man, my, my time is kind of running out because once you start getting 26, 27, 28, it starts getting a little bit harder to get that opportunity yeah. in the NFL. Do, and you, they called you, but they kind of just never asked you for a workout? Always on the short list. You know, so they have like short list of guys that they want to bring in, uh, you know, give workouts to, things like that. And the tough thing is when you're playing in the arena league, it's like, well, you know, I'm actually playing in games and you're kind of banged up. So it's like, even then, if I got called in for a workout, like, man, I hopefully I run well. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I got I got yeah. dead legs, you know. 
So that would have been tough. It's wild. It's a crazy journey. You forget about the human nature of some of these players, the stuff every single player is going through, how different it is, the pressure for all these guys. Um, some some players probably feel the pressure more than others, but man, uh, it's it's wild. But definitely don't don't do away with OTAs because guys at the back of the roster need that. Like superstars don't show up, whatever, who cares? But for the young guys, they need that extra practice time. They need the spring practices. Not just that. They need that money. And I think that's the underrated aspect of OTAs and training camp as well, where guys like me, you get a low bonus, uh, signing bonus or whatever. I'm not Debo Samuel with uh, making a bunch of money. I'm not Nick Bosa who's made 20 plus million to this point, like, or whatever he's made. Like, you know, those guys, you know, during OTAs, I think every week, what was it, $1,200, $1,300? It's probably more now, I'm sure. But that $1,300 a week, I, I, I need that. <laughs> you know, um, and then once training you need happens, that. it was like fifteen, sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars, but like a week. I, I need that too. Now, once the season comes, obviously you get big money, but for guys that haven't made it yet or haven't got the big contracts or anything like that, and they're just fighting to stay on the team, you you need that income from OTAs as well. So when Kyle ends OTAs, I'd probably be like, like, hell no, I'm staying another two weeks. Like, what you doing? <laughs> I not only do I need the money, I need those protein shakes. I need those protein shakes. Hey, they don't get paid in a, you know, so when they go on this break right now, those guys ain't getting paid. You know, when 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 uh the guys that are at the bottom and all that, like then they're not they're not getting paid during this break. And I think that part people forget. So, you know, hopefully, you know, you were able to put away a little bit of money somehow, some way. If you were a guy that was undrafted and had a very low signing bonus and whatnot, like, you know, that's tough. And, and that's where so many bad things happen too, where you, you hear about a player got in trouble, got arrested or something. It was like stealing something. It was like, well, this guy's an NFL player. How can he do that? Is he, he's not getting paid for a month. Like what would, <laughs> what would some of the listeners of this podcast do? Let's hear it in the comments. What would you do if all of a sudden you didn't get paid for a month? Right. Think about it. $1,200 a week, right. Or $1,300 a week. That's only what, about 46, less than $5,000. We're talking about before taxes. Like five thousand dollars a month. Like that's not that ain't no money. <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's better for like a an early twenties single person, right? Right. But man, and then you get nothing. And you don't have any like because you're let's say you're a college player, you're an undrafted free agent, you get paid a couple thousand through OTAs, and now it's like you you don't like you couldn't have had a job that whole time. You don't have any student loans anymore to help you out every month, right? Like there's no income for you. Yeah. What do you do? Well, do you a lot know? of guys go to the CFL. CFL came calling. They offered me a few contracts. Um, I declined because once you go there, they're kind of on your rights for a couple of years. And I was getting older. So now I was like, ah, I'll go back to the AFL. I bought in the AFL and then I got a good payday, uh, you know, in the AFL. So it was like, All right, whatever, I'll stay here. But yeah, a lot of guys is like, well, what do I do now? Yeah. You know. And idle hands too. It's like some some players need the regiment too. So that's why you get into trouble because you don't have like the the early morning wake up call. You're not tired at the end of the night. You don't have every your meals set up. You don't have the the structure right. of life. You, you don't have the structure of life. And a lot of these guys have never had a job before. And I think that's an underrated. I did because I had went through a stretch of three years where I wasn't in school. I was just working and doing all kind of crazy stuff. But I at least had the experience of actually working. A lot of these yeah. guys, they went to high school, they balled, they went to college, they balled, then they get to the NFL, and then, oh, I'm released. Now, what do I do? And I've never worked a day in my life. It's got to be hard for someone who was highly recruited, too, from a young age as a teenager, went to a, a college, you know, D1, and was kind of like a star guy their whole life. And then maybe you didn't kind of measure up and you didn't get drafted high enough. And you're fighting for a roster spot all of a sudden, and you're not like king of the castle anymore, you know? Yeah. It's got to, that's got to mess with you a little bit. The, the good thing that they have today, um, as opposed to when I was, you know, playing in 2013, I think it's a little bit easier now to kind of build a brand. So the guys like Eric Crocker, you can figure out a way to kind of make a way for yourself to where, like, okay, well, I didn't have a good football career, but oh man, like, I got a podcast career and I'm training athletes and I'm able to market myself and mm -hmm. I can build myself up to something that I wasn't even when I was in the NFL. <laughs> yeah. You're making more per week now than, uh, 
than what you're making in camp oh, and in TAs. Not even close. <laughs> All right. Fantastic stuff. Great insight from Eric Crocker. What it's like for a player to go through OTAs and how important spring practice is. Every practice, every opportunity to show yourself in front of coaches uh, as a as a, a player that's that's on the edge of an NFL roster, how important that stuff is. Uh, I love it. Uh, the 49ers have wrapped it up. No more spring practices. The next time they'll be on the field is July 29th, I believe, at the beginning of training camp. But Croc and I will not leave you during that stretch. We will still be here for you. We got the all-time 49ers draft every Wednesday with Nick Winkler. That's been a lot of fun. If you didn't see the first episode of that, you got to go check it out. The first four rounds, we had a lot of fun there. Team Peacock is absolutely dominating that draft so far. Uh, and we're going to continue to go through. We're going to um, continue to look at some undrafted free agent prospects, all the news going on with the 49ers, and maybe go take a look back at some old drafts because they say you can't really judge a draft until three years. So let's go back three years plus. Let's do it. Let's see the old draft, 2019, 2018 drafts, kind of regrade some of those old 49ers drafts as well. A lot of content still coming up as we approach training camp 2022. Thanks for making Locked On 49ers your first listen. Croc and I back next week right here. Locked On 49ers.